Hi friends! Welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany where I have new videos every week about books and the geeky mom lifestyle. In today's video I'm going to be sharing some of my behind the scenes booktube secrets. Okay, so this was actually inspired by a video that Alexa Dunn recently made sharing her author tube secrets. This is apparently a trend happening in the author tube community and I thought it would be fun to bring it over to the booktube community and share some secrets that you may or may not know about things behind the scenes. So I have a lot of stuff I'm going to cover. Let's go ahead and dive right into my first booktube secret. Number one is probably the question I get in comments the most. And even though I have other videos somewhat addressing this, I'm gonna put it here too. And that is, how do I read so much? I get this question a lot. There could be a lot of answers to this, but the main ones that I'll say is audiobooks are a huge help. I can listen to audiobooks at faster speeds and multitask. I'm always in the middle of at least three books in three different formats, and I watch very little TV. I'm talking one to two hours a week. Also, I think I'm a faster than average reader. So put all that together, that's a lot of how I read so much. It's a question I get all the time, and so there you go. That's the secret. <laughs> Reading is my main form of entertainment these days. I don't think that that's necessarily how it should be for everyone, or that other people should feel like they should be doing that. There's not like a quality judgment going on here. I don't expect other people to read as much as I do, but I read a lot and I enjoy it. So if you're wondering how, that's most of how. <laughs> okay, my next booktube secret is about where I film. You might occasionally see a few other parts of my apartment in a reading vlog, but mostly you're gonna see what's right behind me. I live in a two-bedroom Manhattan apartment with my husband and my two kids, and my filming area is in the corner of our master bedroom. So I'm gonna show you a little bit of behind the scenes footage. Also, honestly, my house is often a little bit cluttered or messy because the kids just can't keep things neat and everything that doesn't have a home ends up in our bedroom somewhere. And so sometimes there's like stacks of kids books that need to be sorted through and decide what we're keeping or school supplies. And so I kind of keep it in this corner where I kind of have things the way that I want them to look on camera. But I'll show you a little bit of footage so you can get kind of an idea of where it is. This is basically the corner of our master bedroom. There's a window behind my desk. Th this is it. This is where I film. <laughs> okay, my next booktube secret is the reason that I have pictures of my family, my husband and my kids, in my intro segment of my videos. Now you might think, oh it's because you're a mom and you sometimes occasionally talk about mom related content. That is true. However, it is not the only reason that I've continued to do it. I've noticed since putting pictures of my husband and kids in my intro, the number of weird comments from random dudes online that I get has significantly dropped. <laughs> and uh, yeah, because that's a thing, being a woman on the internet. And so are my kids and husband in most of my videos? No, but I kind of like throwing it out there that, hey, my YouTube channel is not a dating site. And while we're on the topic, Goodreads is not a dating app, guys. I can't tell you, and I'm not the only one, a lot of people get messages from guys on the Goodreads app. Goodreads is a place for tracking your books. It is not a place to pick people up. I don't understand. So if you were wondering, no, Goodreads is not a dating app. Yes, I am happily married in a monogamous relationship, and that's part of why I put their pictures at the beginning of my videos. So if you were wondering, that's it. My next booktube secret is I actually read all of my comments. I don't always respond to all of them, especially ones from older videos or occasionally ones that just don't really deserve or need a response, but I read all of them and I'm not the only one who does. I think most of the booktubers I know actually do see and read their comments and it's interesting to me because I feel like when pe as people get larger or as videos gain more popularity across <laughs> the internet, sometimes people will start referring to the creator in third person. And I've heard from so many of my friends, I don't have this happen to me that often occasionally, but I, some of my friends it happens to much more regularly and they're always like, I'm here, you can talk to me, I'm reading the comment where they'll say, oh, she clearly 
XYZ, um, which is just kind of a, a funny thing. I understand that they're having a conversation with other people in the comments, but it's interesting that that starts to happen. But yeah, I do read pretty much all of my comments, and sometimes I get nasty comments. It does happen. And the thing that I've discovered is very satisfying that I will do when I get that is there's a little button called the hide from channel button. And what's great about the hide from channel button is that the commenter can still see their comment on your video, but you can't see it and no one else can see it. <laughs> so they can just shout their mess into the void. So if I get something particularly nasty or hateful, I will just hide that person from my channel because I don't need that in my life. Yeah. Another question that I get a lot is what do I do with all of the books that I read or the arcs that I finish? And I am one who does not keep all of the books that I read. I don't have the shelf space for it. So I'm actually pretty picky about which books I do keep in my permanent collection. I may not show it on here, but I regularly unhaul books. Finished copies I will resell to my local indie bookstore for store credit so I can get more books. <laughs> I will sometimes donate books to a lo another local indie bookstore that is a nonprofit organization. I will sometimes include books in giveaways, send them to friends, send them to other reviewers. Occasionally old arcs will end up getting into quarterly packages for my patrons. I kind of push them a variety of places. Right now I actually have way more arcs on my hands than I would like to because of COVID. Normally I'm able to get them out faster, but things have just been nuts. Probably if I didn't live in New York and had a car and lived somewhere else, I maybe would have mailed off more of what I have. But here it's kind of a pain because I actually have to carry the packages to the post office. And so I try to minimize numbers of trips. I know Books and Lala mails off most of her used arcs, which I love and I would love to be able to do that, but it's harder living where I do. I... <laughs> Eventually, I had this plan before COVID happened of, hey, we should do like a book swap thing for New York bookish people and I can just bring a bunch of arcs that I don't need anymore and people can have them, but then COVID happened. So maybe one day <laughs> something like that will happen. So if you're wondering what I do with my books, that th those are the things that happen to them. My next booktube secret is about editing. You might be wondering about how do I film? How do I edit? What does that look like? In terms of software, I use Final Cut Pro for editing. I used iMovie for a really, really long time. And then this year, for a few reasons, I was able to upgrade to a fancy computer with fancier software. And if you're wondering, <laughs> I guess another question could be like, wow, iMacs are kind of expensive. How did you afford to do that? Yes, they are very expensive. I'm grateful I was able to get one. The primary reason is I was part of a lawsuit, one of the group ones, and got a decent sized payout from that, which was enough to cover most of the cost of the computer. And then I used money from my Patreon to cover the rest of it. So that is how I was able to afford the new iMac and upgrade to Final Cut Pro, which I love, by the way. I love Final Cut Pro iMovie is great though. You can do a lot with iMovie and it comes free if you have a Mac. So I used that for many years and it was awesome, but I like editing and you can do some cool fun stuff with Final Cut Pro and it makes some things so much easier. Anyway, uh, I'm talking too much about this. In terms of how long I film for, I feel like I'm kind of in the middle in terms of the length of my raw footage. I was watching Alexa's video and she was saying that she barely cuts any time off her videos, which is amazing to me but then I know people who film almost twice as much content as what the final video ends up being and I don't do that either so I'm somewhere in the middle and part of it honestly depends on the video so if I'm doing a wrap-up and I'm having to pause in between to look up like how do I say this person's name or what were my thoughts in my Goodreads review about this thing that I want to talk about I might like have pauses on screen that are easy to cut out Although for shorter videos, it's really not that bad. If I have something that's like a 10 minute video, it does not take me long to edit at all. What does take me a long time is editing my wrap ups because my wrap ups are really long. I think for my last wrap up, my raw footage was about an hour and 20 minutes and I edited it down to, I think around 50, 40 or almost 50 minutes. So that's about how much I was cutting off. And then vlogs take a really long time to edit. Those are probably the most time intensive. They're fun and I like doing them, but they're also kind of a pain in the butt, so yeah. 
And that brings me to my next secret, which is bulk filming. Yes, I do bulk filming. Today I'm not because this is a longer video, so this is the only thing I'm filming. And also when I'm doing wrap ups, because I talk for so long, I won't bulk film. But a lot of times I'll film like three videos at once, edit them all, schedule them to go up. Some people are fancy and change their hair or change their outfit or something to make it look like it's not the same day. I, I don't do that. So if I'm wearing the same shirt or dress, it's the same day. Sometimes I end up spacing them out a little bit, not necessarily always on purpose. It just depends on how I'm planning my videos. But sometimes maybe it looks like it's different days and I'm wearing the same shirt on different days because the videos come out like two or three weeks apart. But no, <laughs> they were all filmed on the same day. That's the only way that I manage my workflow and I'm able to produce as much content as I do. But honestly, bulk filming and planning ahead are how I'm able to produce as much content as I do because I put out two to three videos every week, which is a lot of content for booktube and bulk filming guys, editing ahead, scheduling things. Like right now, most of my videos for the next two weeks are already finished and ready to go. That's, that, that's pretty much how this goes. My next booktube secret is about thumbnails. <laughs> so you might be wondering, Excuse like if my children are yelling in the background. This is the time I had to film this and so if they're Loud they're they're loud. This is how it is um, <laughs> Other secret usually I film when my husband's able to take them out of the house to the playground and that's why it's quiet Or if or like I'll do live streams after they're asleep, but yeah, this is like a bonus secret but in terms of thumbnails I edit my thumbnails using Canva. I recently upgraded to the yearly Canva Pro thing and I love it. It's why I can now do the fancy photoshopped looking things where I have me against a background. It's a fancy feature you get on the paid version so I can now do that which is fun and I feel like I'm getting a lot better at my thumbnails and I think upgrading to the Canva Pro was good but I think the free version of Canva is also pretty good and has a lot of functionality so that's what I use for my thumbnails. How I take my thumbnails, this is the sort of thing that looks super awkward but Basically what I do is at the end of my videos I will pose and do different faces and poses and then pick which one I think fits the best or that I like the best after I look at them and do a screen grab of it and do like make it really large on my screen, do a screenshot and then upload that and mess with it on Canva. <laughs> it probably looks really weird but that's how you get them and I know I'm not the only person who does it this way it made me feel better like I think Alexa does the same thing so if you want to see some examples I'll put the footage in here yep so that's that's how that works guys booktube secret we'd make funny faces at the camera and decide what we think looks best <laughs> okay so next I want to talk about rant reviews now there are true rant reviews and then there are just negative reviews and in this case I'm talking about dedicated negative reviews about a single book. I very rarely do these <laughs> and it's funny because I think the ones that I do tend to get a lot of attention but it's usually only about one book a year that'll make me so mad that I'll decide that I need to do a standalone video talking about why I had so many problems with it. Obviously the one for this year if you've been watching the channel was One to Watch by Kate Stamen London and I didn't even give it one star. I think I gave it two stars or something but I just had so many problems with it and I had to vent them and so I did it in a standalone review. Usually I don't do that. I will be honest about my feelings but typically I'll leave them in a wrap-up instead of doing them as an individual video. And there are a couple of reasons for this. Number one, I don't like the way that a lot of negativity makes me feel. There are, rant reviews tend to do very well. I think there's a lot of people who like that kind of content. I actually don't. <laughs> now, there are exceptions. There are people who do it where it comes across as funny or entertaining or more incisive. But other times it comes across as really nasty or really negative and that gives me anxiety and I watch YouTube for comfort and enjoyment, not because I want more anxiety in my life. Enough of that's coming from other places. So with a few exceptions, I tend not to watch that many rant reviews and so I kind of don't want that to be the main thrust of my channel. The other reason for it is sometimes it just feels unnecessarily nasty because 
some of these books might be from like debut authors who are gonna hopefully learn and grow and maybe we'll get better eventually and that always just feels a little icky to me. I think early in my channel I actually did did one of those and I've since deleted it so it's no longer available but there was a debut book that I had a lot of problems with and I did a standalone negative review and I've kind of since decided you know that was just unnecessary and so it's no longer public. And you might be thinking but isn't one to watch a debut novel? Yeah, kind of, except that she's been a nonfiction writer in other areas for a long time and has enough notoriety. I mean, she like wrote speeches for Hillary Clinton and Obama, so I like I don't I don't feel too bad about that. <laughs> like my review is is, is not and clearly it's been done very well. Most people seem to love it, so like my negative review is not doing anything to hurt it too much. But I do try to be cautious about where and when I target those things. And even when I do a standalone negative review, I try to be really specific about what my problems were with it and why I didn't like it. And try not to just try not to just be nasty for nastiness's sake, because it's just not not my deal. So as well as I'm interested in maybe one day possibly working in publishing or maybe not, I'm not sure, but it's a thing that I'd like to leave open to myself. And so I don't want to burn bridges. I'm always going to be super honest about what I think, but am I going to go out of my way to make a big deal about how bad I think a book was in an individual video? Usually not. The next thing is about scripting. You might be wondering, are my videos scripted? And I feel like you probably can tell they are not scripted. <laughs> um, this is my script for today. It's just a list of my topics that I wanted to hit on in the video and then I kind of go from there. What are things that I do script? For the podcast I recently started, for that I do script my intro and outro, but even then I'll kind of add flavor to it. It's, it's sort of like reading aloud when I read aloud to my kids. Sometimes I'll kind of like switch things around a little bit or use language that's easier for them to understand if it's too difficult. It's the same sort of thing when I do occasionally script things, but for the most part, no, my videos are not scripted. I know people who do that. I don't have time to write scripts. The great thing about the podcast is it's mostly I wrote it once and then I can just change the topic and the name of the person and the books that I'm talking about. So it's not very time consuming. But yeah, I don't, I, I don't have time to write a bunch of scripts. So it's kind of what I think. Now, what I will say that helps me in being able to talk about the books that I read in a wrap up, for instance, is I do reading updates almost every day on my Instagram stories while I'm reading a book. And that helps me kind of get my thoughts out in a logical way. And then I write a Goodreads review as well. And doing those two things usually helps me shape my thoughts about a book well enough that I can then pretty easily come back and talk about it for a wrap up. And if I forget something, I can quickly scan through my Goodreads review and that'll usually give me what I need to say something about it. Next thing I wanted to talk about is, do I watch big channels? Channels of the big popular <laughs> booktubers? And my answer is yes, but not as many as you might think. I love Books and Lala. I watch a lot of her videos, not all of them. Usually you don't watch her wrap ups or her TBRs because I feel like I end up hearing most of her thoughts in her vlogs or other videos anyway. And from her, and I think the content I like from her is her more creative vlogs or different projects that she works on. So I do watch her. I also watch some content from Emma Books. I've met her in real life a few times and we've been in social situations together a couple of times and I really like her. I think she's a nice genuine person. Uh, no, out, out. I'm gonna get out. Joe? Da, 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 me. A passy. Ooh, yuck. Daddy, do another passy. Joe found a passy. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I got so. a passy. Okay. A passy yeah, go. door baby. Yeah, okay, thank you. Don't uh, not. Yeah, I will. Joe, don't knock that over. Just go, Joe. Don't look at it. It's not good for your eyes. It's good for my eyes. It's not. Go see Daddy. Go see Daddy. Okay. I love you. What a party doll. Oh, it's a for baby. a baby. For a baby. Okay, bye. And I think sometimes she has really interesting things to say, so I do watch some of her content. I'll watch some content from Read with Cindy, although, again, I don't watch all of her videos. 
that's probably about it in terms of very large creators. I'm talking like 100k or above. I, I think that's pretty much it. So yeah, I don't watch very many. I might be forgetting somebody, but that's that's most of them. Okay, next let's talk about planning videos. You might be wondering how I keep track of everything that I'm doing in terms of podcast episodes, videos I'm putting out, and my system has slowly evolved over time, but this is usually what I use. This is the Always Fully Booked Planner by Little Inklings Design. It's designed for bookish creators basically, and I really love it. And so to plan my videos, uh, do I wanna show, maybe I'll show you like a, uh, it's so messy guys, but basically, uh, I can't believe I'm showing you this. Okay, but so this is this is what October looks like for me. This is my monthly spread for October. And so what I've started doing is putting my videos and podcast episodes on these little sticky tabs so that I can move them around because before I was like crossing things out and that got really annoying because sometimes I'll change the date that I want to publish things. So this is how I plan out my videos for the month. And um, yeah, and then over on the side, those are books that I need to read for review for the month. October is like pretty hefty. November is not nearly as much, but then I can like highlight and check things off the list when I get to them. Yeah, that is how I do my video planning and kind of keep track of stuff. The other thing I like about these is they have space for, um, I'll show you from September. Okay, so they have a page for wrap ups. And so I put all of my stats for my wrap ups on the wrap up page. And then when I'm filming my wrap up video, I can just look at my different sections and read off what I need to read. I, I know my writing is not very good. But um, yeah, this is really useful. So that is how I do my planning. My next booktube secret is about booktubers and friends. Do I have real friends that I made on booktube? Yes, absolutely. I have people that I consider really good friends that I talk to regularly that are people I've gotten to know through booktube. And this is something that I would definitely recommend if you're getting started, especially on this platform is it's so important. And people on Twitter too. It is so important <laughs> to have a group of friends who are also creators that you can vent to when you need to. I have this, I've got a group chat with a few other people and that is the place where we can go when say we get a ridiculous or nasty comment from somebody that we know we wouldn't want to publicly respond to or respond in the way we might feel tempted to and we need a place to talk about it and a private chat with other people that you trust is a good place for that. Highly recommend, don't talk about it on Twitter, don't talk about it on YouTube, have your group of friends and have a safe space where you can vent about the things that annoy you or the things that make you mad or the things that are gross or weird. Everybody's probably going to need that at some point if they're a creator and I have my private chat group of people that I do that with and it's very helpful. Okay, next I get questions about how I track my reading and about my graphics that I do for my wrap ups. So for tracking my reading, I use Goodreads and I also use a spreadsheet from Brock Turner. I love his spreadsheet. I think I've been using it for three years now. I like it too because I can make changes and add things that I want to it, but I use that to get all that information. And that's where I pull my stats from. I am kind of a stats nerd, so people are asking, oh, where do you get your stats graphics? I made them in Canva. <laughs> I created all of the graphics using Canva. And in terms of like the charts that I do every month for my demographics, I create those charts using Google Sheets. I use my spreadsheet and I tell it what things I want it to calculate based on the books that I read that month and generate my own charts and graphs. So if you were wondering, that is how I do that. There, it's not an app or anything. I did it myself, so. And this actually makes me think, would people be interested if I offered templates for that as like a perk for something or like a inexpensive download option? Because I could do that. I could create templates. Let me know if that would be of interest. Okay, because other people are talking about this, do I read Guru Gossiper? Occasionally, yes. 
I have. A couple of times I've gone in and read a bunch of it. I don't frequently, honestly, because I have a lot of other things to do with my time, but I mean, of course, I think a lot of people out of curiosity in some way have done that. I also, though, have never seen myself on it, so I could see how if you did see something that you wish you hadn't seen, maybe you'd decide just not to. But I also have seen people kind of overreact about it a little bit, and I, I don't know. So have I looked at it? Yes. Do I do so frequently? No. It's, you know, curiosity. <laughs> Next, let's talk about jealousy. Alexa talked about this as well, and I think for many, if not most, creators, this is at least sometimes an issue. I think it's easy to look at how other people are doing and see, oh, well, their videos are performing better, or their channel is growing faster, or they're so good at this one kind of video that I'm just not as good at as they are. And, you know, it can be easy for jealousy to kind of like creep in. I do my best to take a more rational approach to considering the growth of my channel and I also try to take a step back from stats when I need to because I do think I can sometimes get a little too deep into it and that creates anxiety and then I'll need to kind of like back off on it for a while. But I love stats so like I'll like like seeing how are things doing? What if I tweak this? What will happen? And so like the gamified aspect of it from that perspective is interesting, but I do think it can end up becoming a stressor if you're not careful. What I mean by having a more rational approach is I try to look at honestly where I and my content stand in comparison to other channels, not like in a negative way, but in a more realistic way that, okay, why is this channel growing much faster than my channel? Well, usually I can find some specific reasons. Some of it's luck, some of it is just you've been putting out great content, you do one video and for whatever reason the YouTube algorithm runs with it and you get a ton of attention on your channel and I've seen that happen for multiple people and that's it kind of like lightning in a bottle, right? You can't necessarily create that on purpose. You just continue to put out your content as well as you can and improve at the things you can improve at. But I do think my channel is growing at a slow and steady rate. That tells me that I'm doing something right. I feel like I do my best to put out high quality content, improve what I can, and do the best that I can with whatever's in my control and let the rest of it go. So are there moments where I'll have feelings of jealousy? Yeah, of course. I mean, I think if people are being honest, we've all had moments like that, but do I let it dominate my life? Do I let it stay? No, because that's toxic and not helpful or healthy. So that's my feelings on that issue, which I think is a good segue into how do I approach my channel? How do I try to improve? And I will say that the biggest thing that I do is I follow a YouTube channel called Video Influencers, and they put out a lot of really fantastic content for creators and will frequently have really solid actionable tips for how to improve different elements. And that could be how you title your videos, thumbnails, position in the market. There's a lot of things and they just have a lot of really practical tips. And sometimes I'll watch something and they'll, they'll talk about something that I'm like, oh, I'm not doing that. That's not hard to do. Let me go ahead and implement it. So I think they're a great channel to follow if you're interested in growing as a creator, if you're interested in getting better at the work of YouTube. And I think the other piece of this, honestly, is the differences in people's approach to why they have a channel in the first place and what they want out of it. I think one approach to booktube, which is pretty common, is this is a hobby. This is a thing I do on the side for fun. I'm mostly interested in getting to know people and making friends and getting to talk about books somewhere and, you know, I'll dedicate what time I can to it, but it's really just a hobby. Whereas the other approach might be, hey, I want YouTube to be or be a part of a career trajectory for me and I want to eventually be really professional at what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. And those are two different approaches to booktube and I don't think either of them is wrong and sometimes the hobby people can somehow end up making a career out of it when they never intended to just because they're the type of channel that's grown really well and sometimes that doesn't happen. So, <laughs> so for me, I probably land more on the career trajectory side of things. I love the work 
of YouTube. I love the entire creative process and if I could do this and related bookish things as my full-time job I would be thrilled. I like coming up with video ideas, I like filming and being on camera, I like editing, I like the behind the scenes of marketing and how you position your videos. I love all of that and I think it's fun to like learn new tricks in editing and get to use new software and try new things with thumbnails and I I just love it. I love making video content. I'm now doing the podcast and I'm loving that too and as a parent with young children I love the idea of having a long-term career that has the flexibility that I can work around family life. And so yeah, for me, this is something that I would like to be at least part of a larger career long-term. And so, and I'm sure that in some ways influences the choices that I make and the time that I dedicate to my channel. I don't think either approach is wrong. They're just different. Okay, which leads me to my last big booktube secret and that is money and sponsorships. So let's talk about this. I love that people have been pretty transparent about their finances and so I'm going to do the same in terms of how much money does one actually make doing this. And I think the general answer is probably not as much as you think but also it depends a lot on the types of videos you make, on the size of your channel, on how well your videos do, and it really varies. So if we're talking AdSense, which is the portion of the income from the advertisements that play in my videos, I got monetized not long before they made all of the changes to the monetization process where you had to have like this large number of hours of watch time and have a thousand subscribers. So I was demonetized for a few months from that. It didn't take me too long to build back up and I tend to do longer videos so the watch time was less of a barrier for me I think than it is for some other creators. But when I was first monetized, <laughs> but the thing you have to know about how AdSense works is Around the 11th of the month, whatever you've made in the last 28 days or so gets deposited into your AdSense account. Then on about the 21st of the month, you get a payout if the balance is $100 or more. So if you have less than $100, it will roll over into the following months until you do have over $100 and then you'll get paid. That's how that works. So for a really long time after I got monetized, I was not getting paid every month. It might be every two or three months that I would make enough to hit that $100 mark. Then about a year ago, last fall, I was consistently getting really close to that payout point where I would be getting like $80 or $90 a month, but not quite enough to hit that threshold. And then I think January or February, maybe I finally got monthly payouts, which was really, really exciting. And then COVID happened and bam, like there was a big dip. And I think that was true for everybody, big dip in advertising revenue. And so that wasn't happening. So I have recently in the last couple of months gotten back to the point where I'm getting paid every month, which is very exciting. And based on what I'm seeing this month, I think I might make like $200, which is the most I have ever made. I think the most I'd made before was like $130 in a month from AdSense. So like my point is it's not that much but it can significantly grow. So if your channel keeps growing, if your backlist keeps doing well, or if the algorithm picks up one of your videos for some reason, you know, like it can be significantly more. I think the reason that I did so well this month is the collab video I did with Mara for whatever reason was getting higher paid per view than I usually get. So I don't know. Most of the time I'm making about the same and in some months more from Patreon than from my YouTube channel. And then I have had a few sponsorships. And again, how much do you get paid for sponsorships? Not as much as you might think. I think on the low end of videos that I've done, I, I charge more than this now because of my channel size, but I think on the low end was probably like 40 or $50 for a video. And I think the most I've ever made for a video was $200. And that was for a reading vlog, which took a lot more time and effort. So yeah, it's not a ton of money, but again, the bigger your channel gets, the more it can be. 
but it's like you add all of these things together. The thing that I'm happy about at this point is I'm at least self-sustaining. I'm paying for my own books, I'm paying for my own channel upgrades, I'm paying for all the software subscriptions I use, I'm like I have a lot of like expenses that I'm covering and then I have a little more so I'm very close to the point where I can actually add to our family's expenses and eventually that's the goal to diversify revenue streams and turn this into a more sustainable thing long term past COVID. So that is a lot of information. I am losing my voice. <laughs> uh, editing this is going to be interesting. This was I talked a lot. There you go. Those are my booktube secrets. Yeah, I'm curious to hear what people think of all of this. I will say in terms of sponsorships, I will advocate for myself. I have a media kit that I can send to people and they can always say no. And there have been times I've turned things down. I think I learned kind of the hard way. At one point I accepted a sponsorship that I ended up not having great feelings about. It wasn't terrible, but I was like, you know, in the future I'm going to be more careful about what I say yes to. And so, you know, like it's a thing you kind of learn as you go and figure out what to put into contracts and what you want to know ahead of time. Always disclose, of course, sponsorships. But I will advocate for myself. There have been times that I've been offered things just for free product and if it's not something I'm that excited about, it sometimes just isn't worth the amount of time it would take to film a dedicated video and edit it and talk about it. So advocate for yourself. Okay, I think that's gonna have to do it. I cannot talk anymore. My throat is done. Hopefully this was interesting, eye-opening. Talk to me in the comments down below. Let me know any of your thoughts or feelings on anything I talked about. And for your question of the day, tell me something that surprised you. If, if anything, did you know all of this that I'm sharing or were there things that you found surprising? Let me know in the comments down below. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you wanna see more. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.